Welcome to our lecture online. In the previous video, we saw the first part of the Michelson Morley experiment where they send the beam of light through the glass that would partially reflect the light to mirror number two and back and would transmit part of that light to mirror one and back. And we were able to calculate the difference in the time that light took to go from there to there to here and from here to there and back. The difference in time from part one was calculated to be the length, the distance, times the velocity of the ether squared divided by the velocity of the light cubed. So then what they did was they rotated the two mirrors, so mirror one came over here, mirror two went over there, and they did the same experiment. Now the difference is that here the time was larger for this and smaller for here, now the time will be smaller for here and larger for there. Uh, let me take that back. So larger here, smaller larger, smaller. Yes, we're good. All right. Now, when we calculate time one to mirror one, which is now over here, mirror one is going to be over here, we get this equation right here. It looks exactly the same as what we saw before on the other side. So the equation here should look the same as the equation there. And then for time two, which is when mirror two gets over there, we would measure the difference in time. But notice when we take the delta, the difference between time one and time two, the order of the times has now been reversed, so we end up with a negative difference instead of a positive difference. It was a positive difference there, and it's a negative difference here because of the reorientation of the mirrors. So then when we subtract the delta t from part one and the delta t from part two, we take the difference between those two, when we subtract a negative, it becomes additive, and so that gives us the total delta t between what we find here and what we find when we rotate the mirrors 90 degrees. Now, we know that distance equals velocity times time, so the shift is equal to the velocity times time. The time here is going to be the delta t between the two. And so, when we take the difference, which is 2L times the velocity of the ether divided by the speed of light cubed, when L is 11 meters, the velocity of the Earth, which then of course would be the velocity of the ether, is 30 kilometers per second, or 3 times 10 to the fourth. We have to square that. And then the velocity of light cubed. We get this number right here. So what we then see is that the difference between these two times, when we rotate it through 90 degrees, is going to be equal to 7.33 times 10 to the minus 16 seconds. It's a very tiny amount of time. We multiply the times the speed of light, and you get this time difference. Now, uh, I'm sorry, velocity at time, times gives you different uh, distance, gives you the shift in the light, so we get the relative shift in the light, which ended up being 220 nanometers. Now, the shift of 220 nanometers relative to the wavelength of light of about 500 nanometers, that is about 0.44 of a wavelength. That should have been easily discovered through this experiment. Michelson's interferometer was very accurate. It could measure accuracies to about 1 100 of a wavelength, so there was no question that if the ether was real and we actually could see the difference in the speed of light because of the relative velocity of the speed of light and the velocity of the ether, and of course the direction of those velocities, we should have been able to see that shift on the interferometer. It turns out no shift was seen whatsoever. So even though the concept of the ether being present is still there, which gives space some sort of properties, some sort of qualities that allow electromagnetic radiation to move through it and that allow action at the distance because of the force of gravity, it could not be measured in a change in the speed of the light. So ultimately, when Einstein said that all observers see the speed of light at the exact same number, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, or of course it's a little bit more accurate than that, then it turned out that the ether had no effect whatsoever on the speed of light, except the concept was still there that we needed ether in order to explain the propagation of light through space. So we couldn't measure it, but it had to be there. And that was the final conclusion that Einstein drew when he realized the test that they did, the experiment they did, the michelson morley experiment, did not prove ether was there, but Einstein said it had to be there, otherwise we could not explain electricity and magnetism moving through space. And that was the result of that experiment. If that's the case, then why is there a uh, shift in the frequency? So, we, this was a hypothetical experiment. We said 
the, the onset of the experiment was that these things were true. If this is true, then we should see this. Since we didn't see this, the answer was this was not true. Can you explain that thing all over again, except this time from before the shift of 90 degrees? Sure. So let me explain what happens. So if the speed of light is affected by the ether, if it moves in the same direction the ether, the ether moves this way, and so does the speed of light on the way back from the mirror back to here. So that means that the speed of the light here should be the sum of the two. Where does the light come from? Where's the light source? So the light source is here. It gets reflected here, goes to the mirror, gets reflected back, and goes back to the light source where it gets detected. This is before it rotated. Before it rotated, right. Also, light goes through the glass slab and, and gets transmitted to here and back. So we can actually measure this and measure that. We measure it by noticing a little shift in the, in the wave. So you get little fringes of light and dark. And when that shifts over, that's what an interferometer does, you can actually measure the light. Matter of fact, that very same concept was used to measure gravitational waves as well. It's the same thing. You're going to have a difference between the two. And then you measure the ultimate difference in time between this and here by carrying it through the rotation. So you, you, in essence, you double this amount because you wanted as much a shift as possible. If those are all mirrors, I don't see why there's a difference if you just rotate it 90 degrees. Well, in this case, the time that it went from here to here and back was greater than the time from there to there. And then when you rotate it, the time from there to there is greater than the time from there. And ultimately, you take the deltas and you sum them up. In essence, that's what you're doing. Well, because the, it's kind of like, the best way to look at it is this. If you travel up a hill and then down a hill versus traveling at the same speed on the flat, if the average speed is the same, but you spend more time going uphill and you go downhill faster, the overall time will be greater. And so it turns out that it's a longer time to go from there to there and back than it does to go from there to there and back. No, it's not the 90 degree. It's just that the relative direction of the wind versus the direction of the light is like this. So there's very little effect on the amount of time that light spends going back and forth. Almost none. So that's the theory. That was the theory. Then and since it wasn't the case. We never saw the shift. Yep, exactly. So yes, it's kind of like going uphill and downhill. Whenever you ride a bicycle uphill and downhill, even though you, you go much faster on the downhill, it takes much longer to go uphill. It takes longer than to just travel on the flat. It's kind of the same kind of deal. If the speed is faster this way and slower this way, or the other way around, slower, let's see, slower this way and faster this way, the overall time is longer because you were slowed down in one of the directions. So this experiment was not able to prove ether wind. So if we assume this to be true, we assume that the ether was affecting the speed of light. And it turns out, if it was, we should have been able to see the shift. Since we didn't see the, see the shift, the assumption that ether affects the speed of light is wrong. It does not affect the speed of light. Speed of light travels the same in any direction. So what were they trying to prove? Were they trying to prove that ether affects the speed of light, or there is ether in space? Well, kind of both, right? They wanted to prove both that ether affects the speed of light, and then, of course, if it does, then there's no question that ether is there. The fact that they could not prove that ether affected the speed of light made it more difficult to assume that ether existed. But Einstein came around and said, hey, your experiment failed, but I don't care. You cannot have e &M waves traveling through space if there was no ether. And when did he say that? 33 years later. <laughs> yeah, he did that 33 years later. He said that it has to be ether. Just like with every, everything else that we're not sure of in astronomy and physics, there's plenty of people that argue all the different sides and they never agree on anything. <laughs> and that's how science gets advanced. <laughs>